One, two, one, two, three, four. Hey. Hey. Hey, traveling through the infinity, uh You know that nigga pretend to be, uh All that bullshit do not get to me, uh I am spirit and entity, uh Yo Okay I Have a confession Listen <laughs> Shut up, shut up, shut up, shut the fuck up him. He just don't like don't him. Give it a shot. What is wrong with you? <laughs> Listen, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a fan. I love Juju Sukaisen. I just wish my first go around, I loved it as much as everybody else, you know? She's horny. <laughs> you know that one movie everyone loves and praises? telling you to check it out and you're like oh yeah I I'm gonna check it out but you never actually do because you're too busy trying to trudge through rent a girlfriend season three shit you already know I'm obsessed with it <clears throat> I can't get enough meanwhile everyone else is watching peak apparently I don't care I'm gonna keep watching it I'm the guy who never finished season one until last year that's just blasphemous and embarrassing and Lord knows what else I'm the guy that always put the show at the back of my mind because in my head, my pretentious 2000s kid nerd ass always thought that the show looked like a combination of a bunch of already popular titles from my childhood. Because we already know manga offers take way too much inspiration from one another. That's why this show felt like another Naruto, Bleach, or Hunter x Hunter reskin all in one. Just rewrite Jujutsu for Jutsu and my dumbass wouldn't tell the difference. And honestly, I'm saying all this to say, I'm a fan now. I'm a fan! Congratulations all you disgusting manga readers on Twitter that fucking spoil everything for me. Jesus Christ, you get my fucking nerves. You guys make me sick to my stomachs, fam. Honestly, if you guys wanna look in my eyes, you guys wanna do something? You guys, that's what I thought. And I mean it, Gege the offer loves his inspirations. Every time I watched a show in season one, I was reminded of at least three different shows in every episode. It's honestly endearing to see modern authors putting a little spin on the shows that they most likely grew up watching and producing their own art through that. Spirits and curses remind me of Mob Psycho and how they manifest through people's emotions and feelings in the world. Anime in general loves the two man, one woman slash overpowered teacher combination for a unit that usually make up the main characters of shows. You got the plucky hard headed one with the spiky hair. Nine times out of ten he's probably the main character. You got the silent but cool character who's either the rival or just the second main character in some cases. And then there's just a the fucking girl. One, she's a female. Two, she's not a boy. And three, and most importantly, she's a girl. A tried and true formula that honestly needs to be studied and shown in anime culture. They do it too much. I always really liked how the first mission of our not so team seven is literally just Gege's own version of Land of Waves from Naruto. Now with better pacing. And you know, just less emotionally iconic. A team of damn near amateurs gets assigned a mission they are terribly not ready for and if one of them didn't have a hidden demon entity residing in them they probably all would have died. It's a solid first mission to get familiar with our main three how they work as a team, what they value and what they care about, and especially how the outside world reacts to this otherworldly bullshit going on. Holy Jesus. What is that? What the fuck is that? But when your blueprint is so clearly visible, I can't help but point it out. I'm sorry. I'm a Naruto baby. You can make fun of me. This sucks big time. I wanted to pull off a spirit gun or a Bankai or a Rasengan or a We just can't use them yet. And like I said before, this isn't a bad thing. Great art inspires the great art that'll come after it. I think my main reason for not automatically hopping on the hype train for Jujutsu Kaisen was never to be different or look pretentious. Cause I don't really care who doesn't agree with me. It's just my opinion, bro. It's not that deep. We can be friends, bro. It's not that serious. It only gets serious with the non-stop fucking spoilers I get 
everywhere online, deterring me away from really getting invested into the show. I'm not a guy that really likes watching trailers of anything. I really like going in blind so I can ingest the show into my veins. But <laughs> Not on Manga Readers Watch. Manga Readers ruined this show for me a long time ago. I'm actually sick of it, y'all. All I want with Jujutsu Kaisen fans is for them to stop fucking spoiling every single thing that happens in a show. Jujutsu Kaisen fans are like, wait, you haven't watched Jujutsu Kaisen 0.1 seconds after it's airing? Well, Kinda your fault that you didn't see this scene. I open up any social media app. It doesn't matter which social media app. You open up an app, you see a meme or you see a GIF and it's someone possibly very, very injured or even worse and you're like, well, it's time for me to die. I am not joking when I say I literally have a disease when it comes to manga readers. They have given me a disease with all of these spoilers I've been consuming. A disease that I have suffered from before and a disease that you at home have probably been afflicted with once or twice already. This disease is called hype fatigue. And I'll be real, I'm just as much of an inflictor of hype fatigue as well as a victim. I tell people to watch my favorite shows all the time and there is no real cure for hype disease. You can't stop it. It's gonna come. Nine times out of ten, it's going to come for something you wanna watch, but you already know it's gonna be good. So you just, you know, you just, you like, know, just put it in the back of your mind. You just stuff it in the back of the closet. <laughs> And then everywhere you go, every conversation you have, anywhere, they are asking you, have you watched that one show you put in the back of your mind and it's driving you fucking crazy? Hey, have you watched Jujutsu Kaisen? 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 No. Hey, have you watched Another reason why I didn't love Jujutsu Kaisen at first is because if you were an OG, OG supporter of me during the days when I did reaction for anime. One of the shows I reacted to was JJK. I watched the first three episodes trying to capitalize off the hype train like everyone else. And of course that shit didn't work. A whopping three years to watch one season of anime. Because during reactions, I used to always like to be performative and animated while watching stuff. Which made me lose all the substance I gained from a story. It's like I'm too busy trying to make a fucking reaction video instead of taking in the art I'm experiencing. And that was just disgusting to me. I, I, didn't, I didn't want any more part of that. And that's the only reason it took me so long to finish. Now my crybaby back story aside. Yeah, I know. I'm late as fuck to the party. But hey. I bet you I'll be fashion to be late to this damn party. Cause here it is, the big JJK video. Millions of people on the internet love this show. It's nothing new here, and for good reason. But like damn y'all, I, I kinda, I kinda... I kind of want to turn to y'all, like, like I got, I got stuff to say to y'all, fuck. Jujutsu Kaisen is an interesting show to me, because if you're new here, you should know, I love me a good story. And shonen stories haven't really been my niche anymore. What can I say? I'm not 13 anymore. I need more enticing things to watch than the Kami Ga Kill and 2 Love Ru. And JJK has a narrative that most of the time either speaks through an internal narration or through literal godlike animation. Again. And again. And again. This motherfucker don't miss. No, he's fucking good. That motherfucker don't miss, man. He's good. A non-stop dopamine of hype and hand-to-hand -hand Sakuga going into your brain all at once. And it's like, Jesus Christ. Damn, I already came. Give me a second, please. Shonen anime doesn't sacrifice its plot or character development in fight scenes. Yeah, there are shows where a bulk of the writing is done through good dialogue, clever scene pacing, and slow buildups to reveals. But the reason so many damn people 
love shown in anime and something I feel JJK does to the highest bar of excellence is its ability to show character development through a single fight scene. And while watching through all of season 1 and season 2 and a whole ass movie my add you, god damn. I can see in so many instances how the author flexes his ability to tell a story through people slapping each other up. I'm right, I'm left, I'm left, I'm right, I'm right, I'm left, I'm left, I'm right, I'm right, I'm left, I'm left, I'm right, I'm right, I'm left, I'm right, I'm right. But this universe, I feel, is also very underrated when it comes to its world building. It's not made in the best levels of amazing, but I think Gege Akutame built a world that doesn't get talked about enough. It's always just, ooh, tricky fight. Or oh, damn, they kinda bad though. Don't hide now ladies, I, I know what you want. I know what you'll be on. Today's gentleman is Gojo Satoru. If you've ever fantasized about one of the three blind mice from Shrek being a sexy man, I've got some incredible news for you. This playfully sadistic dinner plate will turn your world upside down as you experience penetration within the infinite possibilities of the universe. Oh yes, right there, Gojo. Yeah. I'm gonna be hollow and purple by the time we're done. Bark, bark! I can take him. Not in a fight. Domain expand my I ain't Cinderella, but I can make it fit. Why? Why? I, I see you. I, I don't mind. I, we, we see all of you. <laughs> we see you. Jujutsu Kaisen's world building sort of reminds me of Harry Potter in a way. A lot of Wizard World and the Mudbloods. We got sorcerers in training, professional sorcerers, people called Windows who aren't sorcerers but can see curses since everyone doesn't, you know, want to fight spirit monsters all day, but also just try to help any way that they can. For example, watching through season 2, then re-watching season 1 a second time, I never realized that this woman right here is actually Gojo's classmate from the Hidden Inventory arc. In this whole time, I never paid her no mind, since she barely got any screen time, and I never remembered if they even said her name. And come to find out, she's one of the most important people in Jujutsu society, basically being the in-world Tsunade of the JJK universe. It's like, whoa, I thought she was just, uh, just some random ass doctor with, a uh, questionable and makeup choices. Showing off again that you don't have to become a sorcerer to contribute to whatever Jujutsu society does. Or you have people like Junpei, a character who I didn't understand his story arc at first. So when he died, I was just all like, all right. But in reality, Junpei's inclusion in the story was to build more animosity towards Itadori and Mahito's rivalry moving forward, giving deeper reasons to hate Mahito. She is such a bad bitch though! But to be honest, we barely really needed Junpei to hate this motherfucker. JJK's world is basically Ghostbusters, except the ghosts terrorizing the world are Dragon Ball Z level villains, so we created a school for teenagers to be the exorcists. But it's not just all blue skies when it comes to my opinions on this show. JJK still has my number one turn off when it comes to Japanese animation. Because having visual gags, especially in a show like this, that plays it straight for a majority of its runtime. I talked about it a little bit in my Demon Slayer video that nobody watched. I am just not the biggest fan of visual gags in anime. Level with me here. Listen, don't cuss me out, put, put it back, put it back. I'm someone that loves to recommend shows to new people. And some of the people I want to recommend shows to are people that are just as pretentious as I can be sometimes. Sorry, I'm pretentious. Especially when it comes to the media they consume. I've noticed under my countless hours of trying to get more people to watch anime, strangers, and things of that nature, that a lot of western heads get so turned off by Japan's visual gag humor. Either when a character goes off model, or something goofy is going on on screen, or when the background completely changes, it just kind of de-immerses you out of the story and reminds you, oh yeah, this is a Japanese cartoon. And I've noticed that most western fans don't like it anytime any of their favorite shows do this and honestly i'm just happy it's not just me for once see maybe i'm not the crazy one maybe we all got a couple of um uh, 
screws loose. I wish more offers and studios adapting manga would play their tones completely straight. I don't feel like there always have to be a couple of visual gags. Is it weird to say that I think you can still have comedy with animation without turning characters into chibis? Maybe. Just maybe. This is a gripe that's only really been personal to me and nobody else should really take it seriously. But if you do, comment down below. I want to see you. Another thing while re-watching the show I've come to have a newfound appreciation with is the power system of Jujutsu Kaisen. Domain expansion. Infinite void. Whoa, 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 hey, 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 hey. Actually, living your life is exponentially different from just being alive. If there's one thing I've always had a love-hate relationship with when it comes to shonen anime, it's power systems. And this should be nowhere close to being a hot take, but since Hunter x Hunter crafted the perfect power system that I've ever seen, it's upsetting to know that when I watch any new shonen now, because of the complexity and the nuance of the system, nothing new is ever going to be up to snuff for me. Thankfully, that is not the case for JJK. Rewatching the show has made me see the light. The light that I didn't see before. Because if you don't remember, I was watching the show with my brain off before. I was not locked in for real. The translation for Ju Jutsu Kaisen literally just means sorcery fight. Sorcery. Yeah, I know it's whack. But now, honestly and truly, I am fully bought in on how this world of sorcerers and curses in modern Japan operate. Initially, there's so many things that the show puts onto you to grasp, to learn, all at once. And as much as I liked it, god damn, it was suffocating at times. And I truly can't be the vocal minority for that. I think that trying to learn the JJK power system without doing a little bit of extra homework on the side will literally make your brain fizzle. This is with cursed energy? And that's cursed technique. I see. No, I don't. Uh, okay. Then think of cursed energy as electricity and cursed techniques as electrical appliances. Electricity by itself is hard to use, right? That's why we run that electricity through appliances. Hey man, do your thing. I don't understand it, but do your thing. It all makes sense, of course, in the context of the world. It's just a lot. Dare I say, maybe a little too overly complex. Especially when characters just spew cursed energy babble to try and help explain everything. And because JJK's fights sometimes boil down to 30% the greatest animated thing you've ever seen in your life, and the other 70% will just be them trying to explain the insane shit that you just watched. And it's kind of funny. Impossible, I felt the contact just now. I touched you and not only that, I killed you. No, what you actually touched was the infinity existing between you and me. It's simply swapping my position for that of my opponents. The Boogie Wookie! My younger brother's blood doesn't have the same quality as mine. And even mine probably won't kill you outright, unless you manage to get your entire body bathed in it. A technique that guarantees victory once it hits. You two are strong. You're screwed though. Cause that makes me the worst possible match for you! Strawdell technique! Resonance! Bro, what are you- What are you doing? Why did you explain your ability, man? Bro! Hey, bro! Bro, bro, bro! Explain your ability! Bro, explain your ability! What the fuck is going on? Oh! Shit! Oh! 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 The weird part is, is as a viewer, you need these explanations half the time to even quantify and make sense of what you're watching in this show half the time and it already doesn't help that manga offers aren't the biggest fans of subtle storytelling you know just letting the viewer and the story and the characters unravel what's going on on their own without any needed explanation speaking of which we've been working our asses off no food no sleep no nothing Ever since those titans showed up. That was yesterday, right? Man, 
We're lucky the wall hasn't been destroyed. Still, you'd think that means they'd give us a break. Don't even get me started on promotion. What the hell? Huh? Oh, show not tell! For example, there's a character in the show named Meme, and her and her little brother were fighting this, like, rock, paper, scissor curse. And in that fight, I feel like it's a really good display of subtlety within the flow of a fight, letting the viewer unravel what's happening on their own. It's like, okay, so what the fuck even is cursed energy? Cursed energy is just physical energy. Okay. What's a reverse cursed technique? Negative energy into positive energy is a rather simple one in theory. Just like you were taught in your math class, a negative multiplied by another negative creates a positive. Similarly, separating and then throwing together that negative cursed energy in a multiplicative fashion creates the positive energy necessary for reverse cursed technique. While simple in terms of its explanation, merely being the combination of two negatives in order to create a positive, based on many factors in the series, we can infer that this is an extremely difficult thing for a character to do, and it's only reserved for geniuses of cursed energy manipulation, like characters like Gojo, Shoko, and Sun oh okay okay i understood some of those words so um h how does gojo's powers work um i'm really not sure i think it's so funny that i really had to sit here while watching the show and google how the hell does gojo's powers work how do you operate how do you work i don't understand your abilities the swag kage got a video for this or something because like I, I might need to tune in because even when he explains it to characters everyone is always just like bro what the fuck did you just say even when he explains it again a little bit more in depthly but i can also keep running the reverse curse technique with the energy i generate on my own so i'm constantly giving it a fresh brain to work with i've already nailed shortening my hand seals so red and blue can be activated simultaneously during multiple situations the only remaining hurdles are domain expansion and teleportation over long distances I'll be able to get that down if we set up some courses without any obstacles in Jujutsu High. I'm just sitting here like, damn. Damn, bro, that's crazy. You are so broken. I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna need you to repeat that one more time. In Season 2, Gojo makes a point to literally do the trope of explaining his powers to an enemy because he knows he's gonna win, of course. And, you know, plus, it, it's just in character. <laughs> hey. How do you know what my technique is? Unfortunately for you, I have real good eyes. Anything that approaches me grows slower and slower, and ultimately, it fails to ever reach me. I can't create too large a reaction near myself or I start worrying about the vectors. Basically, it's all super exhausting. Oh, so you're just not fair at all. Got it. <laughs> well, let me get my dumbass out of here. And it's not even bullshit either. Gojo makes sense in the context of the world. You just need three bulletin boards and a line of coke to understand it sometimes. I cannot lie. I don't know. Maybe... Maybe I gotta watch some more Rick and Morty to get my IQ up. I don't know. Like, let me sit here and try to explain infinity to you. One of Gojo's powers. So effectively, Gojo puts up an event horizon. Uh-huh. Basically, something from Einstein's general re... Re 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 relative relative fuck relativity i finished school y'all if you're an observer watching an object fall into a black hole it seemingly stops in its tracks what's that it seemingly stops in its tracks say again it seemingly stops in its tracks what's that yeah i know i'm dumb too i watched oppenheimer and i still don't know what i'm talking about like bruh this motherfucker has me searching up how black hole relativity works. And oh, no, 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 no. It doesn't stop there. We don't just got quantum mechanics and relativity. We also got a whole damn rainbow here, baby. Let's get nuts. Yeah. We got blue infinity skittles where he attracts things to a certain point. How exactly does it work? How the fucking know? <laughs> we got red infinity skittles where it repels things 
And don't ask me how it works exactly, because like I told you before, I don't know, man. We got purple Skittles. And I couldn't even begin to think about the levels of bullshit properties that goes into this technique specifically. As well as just most techniques in this show. It's not just Gojo. Almost every character has a deeply thought out system within the world. It's literally nuts. My brain doesn't even want to think about quantifying it all. So let me try to explain Gojo's powers for you in Oonga Boonga Caveman terms. Yeah! Oonga Boonga nigga stick! Ah! Barrier, push, pull, delete. Wow. Nigga, I'm going home. So despite JJK's overwhelming, complex, yet interesting power system, what else is there to love? Yeah, you know what time it is. One thing I really loved about JJK is that the main trio actually gets along with each other. And I hate that I keep comparing the show to Naruto, but I'm sorry, it's just so easy. Now, unlike Sasuke, who treats both Naruto and Sakura like trash, you never really could completely buy in and believe that they're all really good friends. Maybe when the series said and done you could've, but not the entire time. And in JJK, Megumi does like Itadori. I would say that Megumi is Itadori's closest friend, and Nobro is a close second. Itadori Yuji is our main lead, and honestly, he's a really solid and very likable pro tag. What kind of woman is your type? Huh? Uh, you wanna know my type? Why would you be asking me that now? Never mind why. I'm just evaluating you. <sighs> well, I don't get why it's important, but I guess if I had to say, I like a tall woman with a nice big ass. <laughs> just like me! <laughs> just like me! And despite being a literal Kryptonian, He's just a normal guy, and good god, I needed that for this story. For example, in the first arc when he wants to take the entire corpse of a dead body back to a grieving mother, not understanding the danger and stakes of the situation that they're in, simply because... Yeah. It's only my third day out here, I don't yeah. know. And Megumi, being the rationalist in the situation, tells him not to waste his time on someone he didn't even know. And surprise, surprise, wasn't a good person to begin with. Tadashi here hit and killed a little girl on her way home from school while driving without a license. And I really took this scene to heart, simply because Itadori took this scene to heart. Because it really reinforces his ideals early on. Even if he's completely naive to a situation, he isn't just Mr. Nice Golden Boy main character for the sake of it. Okay, so which girl in our class do you like, Itadori? <laughs> I don't like any of them. Yeah, but if you had to pick one. Huh? Why? Well, if I had to pick, I guess... Ozawa? <laughs> what? No way, man, you're crazy! She's fat! <laughs> Is she? She's thoughtful and neat. You can see it in the way she eats and writes. I think that's kinda cool. His only family's dying wish was just to be a nicer person and simply help people and he took that to heart and i love that i really love how completely contempt with recognizing how much of a ticking time bomb that he is and season two really reinforces that to the viewer you actually really understand by the end of season two why sorcerer society has been trying their hardest to get this man clapped from day one sukuna is a nuclear threat that should be executed. 
You just wish that he wasn't inside the body of the biggest cinnamon roll alive. I always thought it was such a cool concept to have your main hero and villain share a body for the entire story. Before I even saw this show, I thought that would be a good premise for something. And JJK is the product that I was looking for to do this type of story well. Sukuna being inside Itadori isn't just a cute little hidden demon power up. Ooh, I'm about to start losing. What's about to happen? For the first time, you actually never want to see the demon inside come out because he is an actual cataclysmic threat that should never be unleashed into the world. Do not waste my time any longer. Uh -uh. I'll give you one second. Move. <laughs> Simply because he gives zero fucks about human life. Sukuna isn't a power-up. He's his own character with motivations and ideals. I got I got no clue what they are, but you know shit. Bro, the first thing when he said when he got control of Yuji's body was asking where the holes were. I don't have much to go off of here. And he at least acts. Like you expecting a thousand year old man who was human once, only to become the worst possible entity in existence, to act. I like it, Kaji. And the horrifying reality of Itadori's situation is so cool to me because it's so damn unfortunate. Bro found out that he was destined to die for the sake of everyone else's safety the same day his grandpa passed away. And he never really got time to grieve that normally. But considering how Yuji is characterized, I believe he's the type of person to just go with the flow without much thought for how he feels. From day one, he's completely content with dying for everyone's sake. And he's only really faltered in those ambitions once. I don't wanna die. Yeah. But I am gonna die. No way, not like this. No! <laughs> Not like this! <laughs> A proper death? <laughs> yeah, right! Don't be naive! The only gripe I have with Itadori as a character is a pretty simple one. And I know this is a battle shonen, and bro gotta throw some punches, okay? But all I wanna know is who trained this man in martial arts. I've come to terms with his superhuman feats, and that they'll probably be explained eventually. But how is this regular high school guy, with no mentioned prior training, to being in this world of wizards and magic, so comfortable with doing all this bullshit? Bro walked into sorcery like he's done it his entire life. For example, and yes, we're gonna we're gonna talk about the orange jumpsuit kid again. I don't get what this Take Naruto in part one of his story. Bro is donkey booty butt cheats in every fight he goes in. And he makes it through every encounter through shadow clones, buffoonery and vibes. His taijutsu is so laughably bad at first compared to someone like Rock Lee or Sasuke. And we really get to see his progression as a hand-to-hand -hand combatant throughout the entire series. Even in his final fight with Sasuke in part one, he's kind of just like flailing his arms around. There's no serious coordination really. And by the end of the series, you can completely see his progression from that to where he's throwing hands back and forth with an opponent that can literally telegraph his movements. Meanwhile, it feels like Itadori just came out the womb doing spinning hook kicks. This man is proficient. It infuriated me the first time I watched the show, and nobody's questioned it since. Even his superhuman feats annoyed me. You can say it's because all of them really have superhuman feats of their own, but I'm pretty sure Nobara and Megumi can't bust through concrete with their bare hands. Oh yeah! Sooner or later, I think someone other than me is gonna have to be a little curious about this. Megami Fushiguro, on the other hand, will always just feel like a slight reskin of a character archetype I have seen before. He's not a bad character, but he's definitely not beating the allegations, I'm sorry. He has enough about his personality to kinda 
differentiate himself from the characters he's inspired by. And as much as I love me some Sasuke Uchiha, it's kind of hard to match that level of generational trauma. Because I do know people like Megumi. The same deadpan expression with a deadbeat dad and one or two dead family members. It's just that I can only really take so many dark haired prodigy boys before I get a little tired. I don't know, let's talk about a better character. Nobara is the biggest breath of fresh air of a female lead you can ever get from a modern shonen title. You can tell the author cooked, seasoned, and marinated his entire female cast to make sure he didn't have the same problems of irrelevancy that his mangaka predecessors came before him had. Just watch or read most old school shonen titles and you can simply learn how to not write most female characters. Just do the opposite. And out comes our gatekeep girl boss queen, Nobra. Headstrong, confident, but also realistically insecure depiction of a teenage girl. She's allowed to be flawed and arrogant, a trait usually given to male characters while female Male characters are usually shallow, with males being too proud of skill, women being too proud of looks. That shit's over now. We are in the future. Nowadays, I want a girl to be the one giving out a dramatic entrance to save me from a death in the last minute. He is she. Whoa! She looks special. She comes off as very masculine to most people in the show, but when you get down to her core, she's probably the most feminine girly girl in the cast. She definitely watched the Barbie movie, no doubt. I don't give a damn about your men are this and women have to be that. You can keep all that shit to yourself. I love myself when I'm pretty and all dressed up. And I love myself when I'm kicking ass. She's got a point. She's an icon. She's a legend, and she is the moment. Now come on now. Growing up with shows where every female character is written one or the other way, the writing on Nobra was the biggest takeaway for me. And she's also like, kinda funny. You know, you might wanna pull those out. Nailed it. Oh my god, you are so fucking funny, queen! <laughs> Well-written female characters just become completely different when they are part of a trio rather than just support for the male duo. At the beginning, I was scared she would like crush on Yuji or Megumi and just stand there like a goddamn tree and scream. <laughs> but her first appearance is literally Yuji Itadori from Sendai. Fushiguro. <laughs> he looks like a potato. He's definitely the type that ate his own buggers as a kid. And just his name? I can't stand high and mighty dudes. And from that moment on, you love every second of her character. Nobara doesn't need a love interest because she's her own fucking love interest. And it is so refreshing. You don't even understand. Her platonic, besties, brother-sister type relationship with Itadori is so fresh, so charming. Since media nowadays isn't the biggest fan of showing healthy platonic male and female relationships. You sure you don't want to see a movie? My treat. What are you going to see? Human Earthworm 4! You're going alone! Even in season 2 when Yuji's middle school crush showed up and it looks like Nobara was going to get jealous or possibly secretly like Yuji on the low, you realize, oh no, she only thinks it's unacceptable that Yuji might get a girlfriend before she gets a boyfriend. If Nobara wasn't a female, her lack of empathy wouldn't be seen as a character flaw to most people. She does have empathy but just lacks motherly and caring aura that most female characters often get stuck with. Because from the looks in every flashback shown of her, it looks like she didn't grow up with a mother really and that's precisely why she stands out. She's not weak, she's not overpowered, she's not whiny, she's actually badass, competent, important to the story, and impactful in the story as well. I haven't shown you this one yet, have I? Hairpin. 
Ah. And after this season, I really hope this doesn't age like fucking milk. I just want a feminine badass character who is as thought about as the guys. She doesn't need to drop her femininity to be this powerful. All the dudes get great backstories, solid powers, and then all the girls literally just don't exist until the main character starts talking to them. No character defining backstory, no extra power that helps them keep up with them. Like write my girls as actual people. Her having the most basic reasonings for wanting to be a sorcerer and never changing her ideals is kind of funny. She came to Jujutsu Tech because she wanted to live in Tokyo since she's from a small rural countryside of Japan and this is the only way she could financially do it. The only thing that's worrying is how much she's already getting sidelined by other characters. Gege, please, you got something good going. Don't do this to me. Don't fumble the bag. Because there are multiple times within the Shibuya arc that I'm honestly like, okay, Yuji and Megami are all fighting boss level enemies. Meanwhile, Nobara gets beat up by Taylor Swift. Are they okay? <laughs> wearing just overalls? But I'm getting ahead of myself. Bookmark this. I'll get back to it later. And then there's the man. The guy. The dude. Mr. Him himself. Satoru Gojo shouldn't work. Satoru Gojo is an insane person masquerading as a hero. Is that right? Oh, maybe you're right. You're so right! A borderline narcissist and individualist in his youth. There are literal scenes where he easily forgets that caring about people's lives and openly hating the idea that the strong should take care of the weak. Looking out for the weak and protecting them is honestly so exhausting. <laughs> Survival of the weakest, that's the proper shape of a proper society. The weak help each other and discourage strength. Listen, Satoru. Jujutsu exists to protect non-jujutsu sorcerers. Moral arguments? I hate moral arguments. As well as how the betrayal of his best friend made him reevaluate his own personal beliefs and insights on the world. You're really going to kill all non-jujutsu sorcerers now? There's no point in chipping away at something you can't possibly achieve! You're so arrogant. Huh? You could do it yourself, Satoru, couldn't you? Do you think you're the strongest because you're Satoru Gojo? Or are you Satoru Gojo because you're the strongest? Just what are you trying to say? If I were able to become you for a moment, this foolish idea would become a lot more grounded and real, don't you think? <laughs> he got me. I'm stunned by his facts. Let's be blunt. If he was a real person, a fair chunk of the world would hate him for being a borderline supremacist. Everyone talks so casually about how Gojo could probably wipe out all of Japan if he wasn't on the right side already. He expresses himself out loud how much he'd wish he could just kill the higher ups in Jujutsu Sorcery. As you can see in this case with Yuji, the top of the Jujutsu world is a den of vice. Murdering all the fools at the top would be an easy task, but no fix. Cause they'd all just get replaced and then there'd be no revolution. And he just says it out loud cause he's like, fuck are you gonna do about it? Yeah, you're not about to say shit. Gojo is only held back by himself, as well as his love for his students. And that makes him dynamite anytime he's on screen. Now everyone go change your underwear. I know it's a lot to take in, but we're not done talking about Gojo yet, so, so go do that. We all know I love using the waiting for Goku analogy when it comes to father characters waiting for someone stronger to come save the day. It's the fact that his sheer existence in the world of sorcery is so well known. You have random motherfuckers coming out of the woodworks to do hood rat stuff simply because he isn't around at the moment. Gege created a character that exudes so much I'm him aura, he basically made it his main superpower. Because when you figure out the reason he wears a blindfold, it actually becomes kinda sad. Behind his goofy yet malicious personality and in instances, this is a very very lonely man. 
a mortal man who gained enlightenment and divinity, but deeply resented the loneliness it brought him. I love how the author was able to craft an overpowered character and give him so much nuance to the trope he's embodying. My favorite thing about Gojo as a ridiculously overpowered character is that they established two problems with his existence. One, he can't be everywhere at once. He is constantly needed somewhere else at all times in many different places throughout the story. It's hilarious. A sorcerer on par with the cursed spirit would handle this. And in this case, that would have been Gojo. That figures. So, where is Gojo then? Way on business. Hmm? Guy like him has better things to do than loaf around the school in the first place. Don't expect any souvenirs. <laughs> Number two, he's a crutch to a lot of JJK's sorcery world because characters often think if this goes too badly, we can just back up and wait for Gojo to fix everything, showing off how reliant everybody is on him. DMPing him for this arc, putting him in a little flesh cube, removing a huge safety net for humans, as well as the biggest thing to turn curses from just being absolutely nuts on mankind. This is how you fucking do it, people. This is how you give depth to an overpowered character. This is how you make them interesting. Gojo is an absolute nightmare, a global threat, only kept in check by the fact he's just a pretty chill guy. I didn't realize you were chill like that. Absolutely no aspirations for world domination in his head. He's just a guy doing his best to protect humanity simply because he's really good at it and the rest of the cast is just as deep as our main four everyone else in this world simply makes the world feel whole we got the second year students made up of a talking panda bear don't ask me i don't know a guy who only speaks in food ingredients because of his cursed technique a guy that's so haunted by his dead childhood best friend he made it his main superpower and the girl with no cursed energy whatsoever simply getting by by just being better than everybody else. You got a sister school with like three good characters, I'm gonna be honest. I can't name anyone other than Toto, Mekamaru, and Miwa. To manipulation! Weak sight! If you don't get that bullshit out of my face, bitch. I kinda like her, but other than that, everyone else is kinda boring. Toto is the best friend you wish you had at all times. Anytime this man is on screen, it will probably be an entertaining moment. He literally bonds with Itadori about their shared love and appreciation for the Megan Thee Stallion archetype of women in the world. I wouldn't be surprised if Bro's domain expansion is just a bunch of big booty idols with Glock 9s. Did I just... Did I just come up with a great idea? And regardless of him being such a likable character, finally... We have a curse power in the show that is simple and easy to understand. Plus, anytime he uses it, it's one of the coolest things I've ever seen. That's what I'm talking about. This shit means something to me, man. In short, Aoi Toto is my favorite schizo psychopath, and if anything happens to him, I will probably not recover. Now, my biggest drawback for this show, however, is I think the villains. I think the villains of JJK are kind of sauceless. Sukuna is fine, like I mentioned earlier, but everyone else is either lacking clear motivations on why they're so diabolical, and others are just a force of nature here to be annoying and fuck shit up. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry, I never really got the Toji hype. Mahito is the biggest perpetrator of this. He was crafted to be the most unlikable little gremlin in the world. Everyone hates him, and he owns it. Bro is such a damn troll, you can't stand him, and it works. He's the equivalent of annoying-ass 10-year-olds on Fortnite that yap at you talking big-ish, and then back it up by one-shotting you with no effort. And despite how despicable he is, 
I can't help but say, he is really fun to watch fight. In season 2, he completely just evolves into a complete arsenal of whatever the fuck at all times. Based on top of his base power set of disgusting buffoonery, he does so much wild stuff in this season, it's insane. But unfortunately, his character is nothing more than a stepping stone for Yuji's growth. And it works for the story being told, because when it's time to throw everything back in his face, it feels... So good. How's the pie? So good. Sugudo Ghetto, however, is a weird one. Simply because I don't know this man anymore, since his body has apparently been puppeted by another old ass curse for half his screen time. But the stuff we do get to know about the man himself in the flashback arc is cool enough simply because of how it highlights the evil within Jujutsu society. as well as how his relationship with Gojo changes both their outlook on Jujutsu society as well. You can truly see what would make Ghetto turn to the dark side and betray his best friend. If every living person has the potential for cursed energy, why not just kill the people who don't have it? So no more evil curses would be made in the world, and Jujutsu society as a whole would cease to exist. He's got a point. At least that's my interpretation of his ideology. And that's pretty cool in my eyes. And the scene of him making that decision is even cooler. The two shadow heads coming to one head to show he's come to a decision of what he's gonna do. It's the classic, every good villain is the hero of their own story. Humanity treats sorcerers like shit because of their own ignorance and fear of the supernatural world. So Ghetto, in my eyes, is just trying to nip it in the bud and bring peace for his kind. They called me a madman. And by the end of it, I wouldn't be surprised if bro starts spitting out Dano's philosophy. He was suffering in complete silence for the longest after their fight with Toji, being unable to protect an innocent girl, an incident that hangs over him and Gojo's heads even to this very day. Their actions speak to that, with Gojo taking it into Dori and Ghetto, these two random high school girls. The philosophy that's shown within the hidden inventory arc is honestly really surprising. It's simple on the surface. Face, but when Ghetto asks Gojo what is he even strong for, it's hella ironic how Gojo Satoru, the strongest character in the series, lost here. He literally could not win against Ghetto in a battle of ideologies, and he had to let his once best friend walk this dark path. Gojo never believed in the sorcerer's duty to save people, he just went along with it because he somewhat looked up to Ghetto's strong morals, and seeing Ghetto change this much made him question why he was actually fighting himself in the first place. And it's only until later that he understood, instructing a new generation of sorcerers good enough to rid the sorcery world of corruption, as well as being strong enough that they would have never had to see each other die young, as well as also accepting the role in saving people, as he goes to absurd lengths to never make sure anybody dies within his watch. Except the bad guys though, he says fuck them niggas. <laughs> this is the interesting stuff that gets overlooked in JJK's world. It's like a pretty girl that has more things to give to your relationship outside of her other features if you get me. The crazy part is, it's not even that he sees humans as lesser beings of himself. The way it's characterized in the show, it literally just feels like he's gaslighting himself to dehumanize people so he doesn't have to completely accept the weight of his sins. Filthy monkey who can't even use jujutsu. Disinfecting deodorant. I don't want everyone to breathe in the monkey smell. There are money collecting monkeys and curse collecting monkeys. I can't believe he's part of the same species. Now you know why I'm always saying that they're nothing but monkeys. Lower the curtain on the age of monkeys and build a paradise for jujutsu sorcerers. You better watch that mouth of yours, because I don't need any monkeys like you in the world that I'm creating. Sorry about this, but I don't have time to chat with monkeys. In the end, all those monkeys just want to avert their eyes from the existence of those better than them. No matter what anyone tells you, I hate those monkeys. That's gotta be racist, there's no way. And on that day, Sugudo Ghetto made racism his default personality. Which leads us into the meat and potatoes. Why you're really here. You can put your underwear back on for this one. We're about to get crazy.
Before I get real deep into this arc though, it's real bittersweet to talk about the second half of JJK Season 2, since half the time while watching, all I could think about is how many key animators probably sprained their wrists while making this. Everybody has so many buzzword analogies to talk about how good the animation looks, and I use the same buzzwords. Those buzzwords are just immediately followed by, I know for sure the people making this we're not having complete fun. MAPPA and Ufotable animators already need to be drug tested and checked for every new anime that they're making, and MAPPA specifically is on a galaxy level run of consistency, it's insane. The beginning of season 2 literally looks movie quality level. This looks better than the actual movie that they put out for the same show. The camera movement, the rotoscoping, the detailed expressions. I can see every ounce of worry and concern on characters' faces. Every hair flip, every bead of sweat. Like, this is just episode one. That's what I'm talking about. Because once we get to Shibuya, everything goes ballistic. And I mean it. It's every episode. It's back to back to back heat with moments that would be remembered for years to come for anime fans. I can't even count on hand how many new and dynamic action sequences I saw in this half of the season. Cool and creative subversive fights are JJK's strong suit. It's never always just a fight where two or three people are just smacking each other. Their strategies, complex abilities, you have to figure out and maneuver around everybody's abilities because you got guys that can nullify power, summoning jutsu masters, a guy whose literal only move is ibuprofen. You got weak fighters like Mame, but how she uses and maneuvers around her weaknesses is how she's such a strong opponent to fight. She also has, um, other things to like about her. Owie wowie! Baby wants mommy! <laughs> Make it dirty! Except for that incest shit. Gege. Bro. Wh what was good with that? I, I, I don't like that. Shall we sleep in the same bed tonight? Same bed? That's so inappropriate. <laughs> Do you hate me when I'm improper? Nope, nope, nope! Stop talking! Go to jail! You gotta go down on the hottest characters tier list for that one, my girl. It feels so refreshing after complaining about the missed potential of Tokyo Avengers with so many fight scenes needing more time in the oven. Now, I can finally come home to some good fucking food. And it's hard to completely talk about what happens, really. It's all just one big smorgasbord of chaos. We got Mechamaru coaching from the grave, multiple units converging on one spot, for one night only. This is such a nice story concept for something catastrophic to happen. I'm a huge fan of chaos in a narrative when it's written well. One of my favorite episodes starts with everyone in Gojo's life saying to a camera what they think of him. Technically, he's my benefactor. Technically. But then, he's been that for a lot of other people too. Honestly though, I don't really know him all that well. But one thing I know he is for sure, an idiot. Major idiot. Sam Hen. But still. He's flippant. Egotistical. And it goes without saying. He's the strongest! And immediately this would warrant some, you know, death flags being raised. But you're like, no. No, 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 they wouldn't do that. It's Gojo, come on. Good night, Satoru Gojo. Let us meet again in the new world. And seeing the villains have to plot and scheme so much to get one over on Gojo, only for him to just end up killing one of them anyway, as well as in a way where I can only describe as killing a man with sheer vibes and aura alone. <laughs> I love tests of character morality. The villains don't think Gojo would kill a few to save a few because of the way his domain expansion works, but instead, he just saves everybody with multiple moves in just two seconds, so the lasting effects of his domain on regular muggles wouldn't be permanent that shit was just so cool i can't lie and it's just that this arc is about a singular incident that destroys basically most of shibuya and it's just really fucking cool there's not really much to be mad about here itadori's fight against choso is probably one of the greatest anime fights 
I've ever seen. Hands fucking down. Probably one of the best fights I've ever seen in media. This fight is an experience you wish you could permanently engrave into your brain so you can never forget this moment. And the best part of it takes place in a fucking bathroom. I've said before how much of a fan of martial arts I am, so when I saw Mappa paying homage to a fight scene from the movie Raid, I shit my pants. And once that masterpiece is over, it's just tension building from here on out. It just keeps building, because then Sukuna enters the fight and brings out the most pure evil aura as soon as he enters the screen. And I'm not the biggest fan of evil for evil sake villains, but Sukuna just does it so well. He's gotta be one of my favorites at this point. Did you believe taking one knee was enough? The boughs that bear most hang lowest, yes? But I guess you guys are pretty lightweight. Yeah, he let his nuts hang here on this one. I love how Sukuna tells Jogo if he can land a hit, he'll actually join their side, only for the next episode to immediately start with him in the air. Yep, that's me. You're probably wondering how I ended up in this situation. All proceeding into one of the funniest scenes in the show. Panda! Hurry up and run! No, you won't. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, damn, bro. Jogo isn't even weak. He just keeps getting mismatched opponents. Dolfer really did not fuck with his character. He really did him dirty. Oh, and did I mention at the same time Megumi is fighting Toju with bunny rabbits? Almost dies. And then gives us a resolution to the move he was gonna use on Sukuna in season 1. Summoning this fucking demigod of a creature he has no control over named Maharaga. Bystanders are dying, cool shit is happening, and at some point, you have to get on your knees and ask yourself if you're even worthy to be experiencing what you're experiencing right now. What did I do in my life that was so good that I deserve this? And it all ends with Sukuna doing the most dickhead move, bringing Itadori back to the scene of the crime of the place where his body was just used to murder lots and lots of people. Fuck, that's so good. And then, it just doesn't stop. Like, please, I've already came. Please let me go. We got Nanami's send-off, Itadori and Mahito fighting. Toto's back, don't ask me why, he's here now. There's stakes. People get fucked up. People die. Living isn't guaranteed in this story, and everyone doesn't have plot armor. Bro, Itadori is missing some of his cheek. Nobara almost dies after finally getting to do something in the story. Tell everyone for me. Life wasn't so bad. It was chaos to the point that they tried throwing in a cute little flashback and I'm just like, yo, get, get this out of here. What happened to my girl? And for me, there isn't really a concrete conclusion to this arc that's satisfying. It kind of just stops the way it started. Abruptly. There's repercussions for everything that happened in this arc. I love seeing the rest of Japan react to this wild shit that's going on. It's like, why is there a black hole in Shibuya? And it all just ends with the speculation of everything going public to the world. Of the existence of curses and sorcerers. And to me, that's just good writing. Just showing off that the outside world, the father characters we don't get to see, NPCs, matter. They aren't just here for a setting for our heroes to have a big superhero fight. The animators and the voice actors clearly reached 120% of their potential during this production. And it's safe to say they really need a long ass break before the production of the newest season. But looking at MAPPA's latest slate of shows, I don't know, it might be looking like they're about to be putting in a little bit more overtime. In Itadori's speech to Mahito, you can hear every inch of malice that Yuji has for him. Every fiber of his being. And Junya Anoki displays that beautifully here. All in all, this was simply an iconic season of anime. An iconic season of TV history. Jujutsu Kaisen Season 2 is something I will show my grandkids 
and their grandkids after that. And it just sucks that it came at the cost of so many passionate animators' health. Because the people running this show clearly love the show. I really hope the industry gets better with this issue, but Japan is a really stuck in its ways country. I can only really express what I can from my small ass platform. I don't know how many shonen can do action better than JJK Season 2 just did. It might be impossible. I can't lie. Jujutsu Kaisen isn't peak storytelling or anything, but it might be just one of the greatest shonen stories ever told without even being a storytelling masterclass. Because goddamn, this was a ride. Instead, it's a complete action masterclass. And honestly, if you were like me, being a stupid ass hater for this show, stop it. Get some help. And then watch this legendary season of television. Because you can best believe that everyone else will be talking about it for many, many years to come. And the award for anime of the year goes to <clears throat> Jujutsu Kaisen season two! That's some bullshit. Then you tell me this was over.